Finally, we are going to program something today using Unreal Engine 5. Let's get to it. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode, and today we are going to program something. I suppose the official term is we're going to visually script something, but it doesn't matter because the end result is exactly the same. By the end of this episode, you're going to have a character that with one click, you can toggle from walking and click again, toggle right back to running. We're going to do this with Blueprints, which is the visual scripting tool available within Unreal Engine. Blueprints are going to take up the majority of this episode. Think of Blueprints like a language in interacting directly with your game. And the better you learn the language, the more effectively you'll be able to accomplish the goals for your game. And just like in our last episode, we're going to go through a general orientation, but this time focused on blueprints. And also, I'm going to give you the simplest, but still, in my opinion, the most useful troubleshooting tip when stuff in your blueprints isn't working. And of course, we're going to end the episode by having that toggle set up between walking and running, using a keyboard button of your choice. So here are the key concepts I want you to take away from today's episode. There are many different kinds of blueprints, but today we're primarily going to be focused on the third person character. That being said, even though we're focused on this one blueprint, the four key aspects or parts of blueprints that we're going to focus on, they really apply to every kind of blueprint. And those are variables, components, functions, and events. So if you haven't done so already, let's boot up our game and we're going to get right into it. All right, so last episode during our orientation in our content drawer, we organized our key blueprints, putting them all under our core folder. And so if you navigate to that folder, we're going to be primarily working out of the third person character blueprint this episode. And so as I mentioned last episode, blueprints, what they're really there for is to give instructions to each actor as to how that actor is going to act in the world. It's basically the software, the brain behind that actor. But what's different about it compared to traditional software or traditional programming, if you double click into that, it uses what's called visual scripting. So the logic that tells the blueprint what to do for the actor, it's all in these nodes here. And we're gonna cover all of this this episode. So we're gonna start out this episode with an orientation of all the parts of a blueprint. And even though we're in a third person character blueprint and some of the things that are in this blueprint are unique to a character, most of the elements that we cover today are universal to all blueprints. So it's gonna be really useful to know this stuff generally. So when we first come into the blueprint, we're brought to the event graph. And the event graph is what's actually dynamically updating the actor in the game. So any event that triggers for this actor in the game, those events are going to actually have actions that occur. And so when I say event, you can see if I zoom in with my mouse wheel here, we have actions that are occurring when I input access turn right or left, or when I look up or down on the mouse, when I move forward or backwards down here. And so these events that you see here in red, this is what's actually driving it. When I hit play and my character actually moves when I do W, A, S, and D, or I jump around, all that is coming off the third person character blueprint. So in this episode, we're actually gonna create a brand new event. I'm gonna show you how we can tie that event to caps lock or really any key that you like in making a walk run toggle for our character. But before that, let's start with a general orientation. So I'm gonna start in the top left corner and work our way around the blueprint. So in the upper left hand corner, we have our components panel. And I'd like you to think of the components panel the same way we talked about the world outliner in the last episode. So the world outliner is to the level the same way that the components panel is to the actor. So the blueprint of the actor that we're actually addressing. In this case, the third person character. And so the components panel shows you all the pieces of the third person character. So we have what's called a capsule component. And if I want to see what that is, I can go over to the first tab here in the viewport and you see this little outline of a capsule around our character. So the capsule is there for what's called collision in the game. So basically whenever our character is running and I'll just demonstrate this really quick. So if our character is running and boop, I just bounced into the wall. So notice that he's not actually touching the wall in this case, but he's still stuck there. And what's actually hitting the wall is not our character mesh directly, but it's our capsule component. 
So the capsule is a simplified representation of where that character is in the world for the purposes of things like physics, collision, etc. And it's a lot easier for the game to process the capsule than it is to process where every single part of the mesh is on the character. Now, we could still do that. There are definitely situations where we're going to want to do that. For example, the player's hand might need to touch a wall and we don't want it to go through a wall. But in general, the capsule component works really well for that purpose. And we have an arrow component. Well, that's uh, in an inappropriate spot. Maybe Epic should change that, huh? And then we have our mesh. So the mesh is what we talked about last episode. So that's the physical geometry of our character that we see here. And then we have our camera boom and our camera. So if you know how a movie is made, you know, the camera is always stabilized by something called a boom. It's basically a giant arm, just like, just like this, that stabilizes something. In this case, it's a microphone boom. But in our case here, we have a camera boom. And the camera boom is entirely virtual. It's invisible. But basically, it pushes the camera out a certain distance back from the player. And so in our next episode, I'm actually going to show you how we can adjust that camera and boom so that we can turn our third-person camera into a first-person camera if we wanted to so that it's directly inside the player's head and then zoom out again back to third-person view if we like. And then last but not least, we have our character movement component. So this is a ton of settings all related to movement on our character. And only one of these we're going to have to actually alter this episode, which is this walk speed here, this 500. And so the components panel has pretty much the same relationship to our actor the way the world outliner has to our world. And an example of that is if I go up to add here, I can add just about anything to our actor. So for example, let's say I want to add a sphere. And when I do that, it gets added to our actor as one of the components. And in the viewport here, we can actually transform, translate that actor in any direction we like. So let's say I want this ball to kind of sit above Manny's head. And maybe I want to change the scale of it to be a little bit smaller. So 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. And because that's attached to the capsule component, you're going to see that ball kind of float around. I'm going to compile and save. And let's go ahead and play. You'll see exactly. It's just kind of floating there because even though the mesh is jumping, the capsule's stable. So the ball is just sitting there. All right, so we'll go ahead and delete that sphere. And now I want to talk about the details panel on the right hand side. So if I select something like the mesh, last episode we changed our mesh here on the right and we also changed our animation blueprint, our anim class here. And so this details panel on our right, it works the same exact way as the details panel back in our world. So if I select a given actor in our world, I have all these settings for the details panel. If I go back to our actor and select a component, I have all those settings for the component. But you'll see the settings change quite a bit. So depending on the type of component, and it's the same way in our world. So depending on the type of actor, we're going to have different settings that we can change. But in general, pretty much all of these have a transform. It's like, where do we want that thing in relation to whatever its parent is? So in this case, you know, the capsule is the parent of the mesh. So when you're looking at the location here and the rotation, those are the location and the rotation in relation to the capsule just as the location and rotation here are in relation to the world itself. And then in the bottom left hand corner, we have the My Blueprint panel. And this is basically every single element, every single thing that's part of our blueprint. And it's got the event graph, which is what we were on first. And then it's also got the construction script, macros, variables. Some of this we're not going to cover this episode, but we are definitely going to cover variables. Let me just take a quick detour and cover the construction script. So whenever an actor is first placed in the world, all of the logic, all of the instructions that are attached to the construction script, they are loaded. And the construction script does not run when the game is loading. It's basically a one-time set of instructions that are executed on our blueprint. And whenever I use the word executed, what that means is that the instructions go, the instructions happen. And the construction script is only executed once, whereas the event graph, every single time that one of these events is triggered, so if I move my mouse, for example, when I'm in play mode, one of these is going to be triggered. All right, so now let's back up and let's go back to what we wanted to do this episode. So the goal of this episode was we wanted to program our character to, with one click, be able to switch him from running to walking and vice versa. So what do we need for that? Well, we need an event. We need some occurrence, something that occurs on our character that's actually going to switch him from walking to running. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scroll down all the way underneath the existing event graph. And by the way, to zoom in and zoom out, I'm just using my mouse wheel here and to drag around, I'm just right clicking like we learned last episode and moving around. So without right click, I can just navigate my mouse around, but holding right click, I can just drag that graph around. And typically what I do for all blueprints is I lay them out chronologically 
from top to bottom. So the earliest stuff, the stuff I built first is all the way at the top, and then I go sequentially down the list. Because when I was just starting out with blueprints, I ended up building these massive convoluted blueprints where I couldn't even follow or understand any of the logic I put in place. So that's just a best practice I learned along the way. And the other best practice that's really important is commenting on your build. So as you put together blueprints that are more and more complicated, you're gonna wanna specify what each piece of it's doing. And that's exactly what you see here. So what I'm gonna do to start actually is I'm gonna comment on all of this, that all of this is kind of the out of the box setup for our third person character. So the way I do a comment is I hold left click and I drag from the corner to the opposite corner and that's gonna highlight everything. And then I just hit C on my keyboard and that's gonna comment. And I can also hold left click and kind of reposition that comment a little bit, but I can say something like all original event graph setup for our third person character. Because in general, we're not gonna to touch that. We might touch that at some point, but not for a while. All right, so we got our comment there. Now I'm gonna come underneath and this is where I'm gonna add our first new event. So how do I add an event to our event graph? Pretty much any node that we add here, we can add it by right clicking. So if you right click anywhere on the open space and you just search for really any keyboard button you like at this point. So I'm gonna choose caps lock and we have a keyboard event there, caps lock, and there's our event. So when it's pressed, it's going to execute, it's gonna do something. And anytime you see one of these white pins, that's an execution pin. So an execution pin is, these are the instructions that are actually occurring when that button is pressed. And so we also have this release. So for example, if you wanted a sprint button where you wanted the player to actually have to hold down the sprint, and then when it's released, they would stop sprinting, you could use that particular execution pin. But in our case, we just want to toggle between walking and running. Now, before we get into that toggle, I want to talk about my single favorite tip for troubleshooting our build. And that is to print what is called a print string. Basically, the idea is if you're uncertain whether or not a certain node is even being hit or a certain part of your graph is being hit, what you can do is you can tell that part of the graph to print a print string. And then you can see that when you're in play mode. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to left click, drag out from the pressed pin and release the left click. And then you get an option to pull in another node. And here we're going to pull in a print string. And all this is doing is when caps lock is pressed, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to print hello in this case, but I'm going to change it to does caps lock work in all caps, ironically. And then I'm just going to compile, save, I'm going to minimize this and we're going to go to play. And so this is how we test whether or not that actually works. So how do I test this? Well, I got a caps lock button on my keyboard, right? I want you to take a look in the top left corner all the way up here. So here we go. Caps lock. Caps lock, caps lock, da, 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 da. yep, and there it is. There's our print string. So love it when things actually work. So we know that our event is actually firing on our third person character here. So I can escape out of play mode and I can come right back into our blueprint. So now we've got to figure out what we want to have happen when our caps lock is pressed. But let me take a step back again because think of your typical game that you play. So it's, it's typically not the case that you're stuck with a certain button doing a certain function, right? Like typically the player has control over what button do you want for this and what button do you want for that? So could we set up the same sort of structure in our game such that the player themselves will ultimately have that ability to change the buttons of their game? And the answer to that is yes. So the way we're gonna do that, if I minimize our blueprint here, and if I come up to settings in the top right corner and I go to our project settings, now this is new, we haven't covered this before, but there's a billion and a half project settings here. We don't need to worry about most of them right now, but if you search what are called action mappings, so if you just search for action, that should be enough to find it. And there we go, we have our action mappings and you see we already have one. So we have jump is actually tied to two different things in our game already, so spacebar and the gamepad. And so we're gonna add a new action mapping here and I'm gonna call this walk, run, toggle. And then we could add our keyboard button. So this is where we could add our caps lock. And you see here that you have the ability to require modifiers for a certain action mapping. So for example, we could require control plus a button to execute something. But in our case, we just want a simple caps lock since walking and running is probably gonna be a common toggle. So let's then exit out of project settings. We'll go back into our third person character blueprint. And instead of caps lock, I'm just gonna delete this out 
I can right click and I'm gonna search for our walk run toggle. And there's our new event. And by the way, so events can be not just keyboard or mouse, but really they could be anything. They could be an occurrence that happens in the game could trigger an event. And so we're gonna get into that quite a bit as we do more with blueprints in the future. All right, so now let's test out whether this new event actually works. So let's connect up our press. So left click, hold, drag, and connect, and compile and save. And I minimize again, we'll try it one more time. So now I can spam caps lock. Does caps lock work? Yes, it does. So we are all set. I'm gonna escape. Let's go back to our blueprint. And now I can delete out the print string node. We don't need that anymore. All right, so now we get to the big show. We gotta figure out how we put in logic programming really to figure out are we currently walking and if so switch to running and are we currently running and if so switch to walking and there's actually two ways that we could do this there's something called a flip-flop which quite frankly is probably the easier way of doing this and the flip-flop it basically I could show you that real quick so I could drag off and just search for flip-flop still got that caps lock enabled uh, but basically what flip-flop does is it checks is a true then switch to b and if it's b true then it switches to a it's very simple but I don't think I'm gonna set up a flip-flop in this case. I wanna actually teach you the more complicated way of doing this. And the reason is a situation like a cutscene. So let's say the player is currently walking and then you enter a cutscene in the game. And then coming out of that cutscene, maybe you, there's a lot of action and you want the player to just instantly, automatically be running right out of that cutscene. So the problem is if we just have a flip-flop, we could tell the blueprint, okay, switch the flip-flop. But the problem is we don't know if the character was currently walking or currently running necessarily. There's not an easy way to then programmatically say, okay, always be running no matter what coming out of this cutscene or always be walking coming out of this cutscene. And so we want that control ultimately within our blueprint. So really the question is, how do we store that information on our actor, on our blueprint, such that the game knows at any given point in time, is the character currently walking? Is the character currently running? And also the game can reference that and say, well, coming out of this cutscene, let's make them run, let's make them walk, whatever it might be. So to do that, we need what's called a variable. And whenever I say variable, think of it as just data that's stored on that actor, on that blueprint. And so there are variables of different types. And our first variable that we're going to create is simply going to store whether or not the player is currently walking or currently running. So to create a new variable, just navigate over to the plus sign, select that. And we're going to call this walking with a question mark. And you see that that variable has a type of Boolean. And you can also see that type over in the details panel on the right hand side here. And so a variable type is what type of data is that? And a Boolean, it's very simple. It's true or false, that's it. So are they walking or not? And down below we see, please compile the blueprint to see a default value. So I'm gonna come up on the left side and save. And then we have our checkbox here, walking. So by default, do we want the player walking or running? So I think by default, we should set it to running. So this would be unchecked in that case. But this Boolean, this is what's gonna be checked by our logic to see, is the player running? And so the way we evaluate a Boolean, and when I say evaluate, it's really just a check. So you can click on that variable and you can drag it into your event graph. And by the way, this is exactly how you can reference anything in our blueprint. You just click and drag and drop. And then we have an option for get or set. So get is we're getting the data, whatever it's currently set to. And setting is we wanna set it, we wanna change it in some way. So in this case, we're going to get walking and I can move that in a position. Now, so how do we actually check whether or not the player is currently walking? So I'm gonna drag off a pin there. And for this, we're gonna use what's called a branch node. So if you search for branch, so in programming terms, this is called an if statement, but a branch in blueprints is really just a true or false. And you're gonna use branches all over the place. And so when I drag off a pin from the Boolean, it connects right up to that branch but I have to actually connect what's being executed. So when I press this button, then it does the branch note. Then it's gonna evaluate whether or not the player is currently walking, this value here. So then the question is, if they're walking, what's gonna happen if that's true? What's gonna happen if that's false? And so let's test this out right now. So if I do a print string, I'm just gonna do a print string from the true, and this one's gonna say walking, and then we're gonna have another print string. And to do that, I'm just gonna duplicate. So I can do Control-C to copy. 
and then control V as in Victor to paste. And I'll connect this up to the false and I'll just say running. So if this is true, it's going to print walking. And if it's false, it's going to print running. So let's compile and save our blueprint. And then I'm going to play and let's hit our caps lock. So he's currently running. So that's correct, right? And then if I come back in here and go to walking and let's say I change the default value to true and then compile and save and I can test this again. So if I go to play, now I hit caps lock. Now it says walking, but I haven't actually changed my character in any way, right? So all I've done is I've changed the variable, but the variable is not connected to anything yet. And so that's what we still need to do in our blueprint. So instead of printing, we actually need to connect this up. So I'm going to delete out those two print strings. So now the question is, how do we actually change the character's movement to go from running to walking? And if you heard me say earlier, we're going to do that underneath the character movement component here. And the other thing you heard me say earlier is that for basically anything here, our variables, but also our components, we can drag that into the event graph in order to get a reference to it. So this is where we can actually change our character's movement speed. So let me show you what I mean. So now we're referencing our character movement. If I go back to character movement for a moment, you saw all the different properties, everything that we could change on that character movement component. But the one thing that's relevant here for our walk run toggle is this max walk speed. So as it currently stands, it's set to 500 centimeters per second. And what we can do is we can switch that right here in our event graph. So I can get a reference to the character movement component and I can specifically search for max walk speed. Man, this caps lock is killing me. And then we have the ability to get max walk speed or set max walk speed. So this is where do we want to get that 500 value or do we want to set it? Well, we don't need to get it in this case because we already are going to know whether the characters are walking or running. So we don't need to actually reference that speed. So we can directly set that walk speed. So I'm going to set the max walk speed and I'm going to connect up true because if the character is currently walking, then we want to toggle them to running, right? So I'm going to connect that up. And so what speed do we need to set this if the character is currently walking? Let's go back to our character movement because by default, we got our max walk speed of 500 there. And so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to set it to 500 if walking is true. The other thing is let's make sure to go back and walking and uncheck that because by default, our character is not walking, right? I'll compile and save. Now, the question is, what do we do when walking is false? So when the character is currently running, what do we want the movement speed to be set to? So here's what I want you to do. Just click and drag off your character movement again and again, search for max walk speed. And again, we're going to set the max walk speed. And now we're going to connect up the false branch. Now we don't want the max walk speed set to zero, right? Because we want our character to still be moving, but we want a much lower speed than we currently have. So let's set it to something like 120. All right, let's take a look at this, see what it's doing. So when I hit caps lock or really whatever button I tie this to, it's going to evaluate whether or not this Boolean is true. And if so, it's going to set the character walk speed to 500. And if not, it's going to set the character walk speed to 120. But here's the thing. So we're not yet changing walking in this event graph at all. So what I mean by that is if they're currently walking and it's true, and then we switch them to running, this Boolean is still going to be true, meaning we need to change it after we set the movement speed. So here's what I mean. So I can click and drag our walking variable into the event graph. And this time we're going to set it. Because keep in mind, every time we make this switch, we actually need to switch this variable. If it's true, we need to switch it to false so that the game knows that they're currently running. And if it's false, it needs to be set to true so that the game knows that they're currently walking. So I'm going to connect up that pin. I'm going to select walking in that case. Oh, nope, that's incorrect, right? Because if they're currently walking, I want to uncheck it. And then I'm going to select set. I'm do, going to do control C to copy, control V to paste. And I'm going to connect that up down here because if they're not walking, then I want them to start walking. So then the next time I press caps lock, this is going to be set to true. And then it's going to go walking. Yep. True. And boom, back to running. So let's give this a whirl. So I'll compile, save, minimize, play. All right. I'm currently running by default, right? I'm going to hit my caps lock. Oh, look at that. Half the time it works, 
every time. Now you're probably wondering, like, how is the animation changing automatically in addition to the actual speed of our character? And that's being driven by something called a 2D blend space that's tied into that animation graph. And that's something our character comes with automatically. But we're going to get into that in editing animations probably in about, I said 15 episodes last episode. Now it's down to 14. You can call me on that if I don't hit it in time. But to me, it looks like Manny is walking here a little slowly. So let's back out of that. I'll go back into my blueprint. I'm going to change it to 150 now and compile and save. And then we'll try that one more time. Caps lock. Yeah, it's a little bit better. You could set this to, to whatever you want just to try it out and see how that animation changes also over time in addition to his speed. So now let's go back to our blueprint. All right, so we know how to set our character speed, but there's another level to this that I want us to go into this episode. And that's the situation where inevitably throughout a game, you want your character, you want your player to feel like they're progressing. And in my game, I expect that the character's walk and run speed will ultimately change over time. And they might get a boost where they can suddenly run very quickly. And so the challenge is we need to store the data as to what the character's max walk speed should be or max run speed should be at any given point in time. Because then we can update that max speed over the course of the game. We can do it programmatically by referencing the variable just like you see here for walking. So how do we do that? Well. We need two new variables. And how do we create new variables? Well, we come over to variables on the left-hand side, plus, and this one I'm gonna call the max run speed. And now for this, is this gonna be a Boolean type? Is this gonna be true or false? No, right, it's gonna be a number. So how do we give it a variable type of a number? So if I go into the variable type, for numbers we have integers and we have floats. Now what's the difference between an integer and a float? For this, I gotta go back to my high school math and you know what, to be honest, math is the furthest thing from my strong suit. So I hope for any viewers out there that we got some math geniuses. And because eventually when we get to the really complicated math in these blueprints, I'm going to need the help. But the difference between an integer and a float really is, is it a full number, a whole number, one, two, three, four, and negative, negative one, negative two, negative three, or is it a, de a number with a decimal point? So 1.34618. And I know our max walk speed in the character movement component is a float because I can see it in the bright green here. So you can always use the colors to correlate those. So whenever you're setting one variable to another, it's always good to make sure that they have the same type. You can translate from an integer to a float, but it's awkward to do so. It's always best to do it the simplest possible way. So we're gonna set that to be a float and then I'll compile and save. And then I'm just gonna create one more variable. So we're gonna have our max walk speed. And that'll also be a float by default. And again, compile and save. And now for the default values, we're gonna set our max run speed to 500 because that was the default on our character movement component. And for our walk speed, I'm gonna set it to be, let's do a pretty brisk walk. So let's say that's 200. And then I can compile and save again. And this way, as the player progresses through the game, we can always change whatever the max run speed is and whatever the max walk speed is just by updating a variable the same way we set walking here. All right, so now how do we actually update our blueprint here to reference max run speed and max walk speed? So it's pretty easy. Instead of setting the value directly like we have here, I'm just gonna drag this in, drop it right next to it, get max run speed, whatever that might be, hook that up, because now we're gonna set the max walk speed that's on our character movement component, we're gonna set it to this max run speed variable that we just created here. And we're gonna do the same exact thing for the max walk speed. Get max walk speed. Now I can compile and save. Now I should be walking a little bit more briskly when I hit caps lock. Yeah, that's kind of a serious walk there. All right, I'll escape out and we'll go back to our blueprint here. Now we're starting to get what's called spaghetti. And so whenever you get a lot of these lines all connecting up, it can get confusing to keep them all organized. So one tip is if you double click on any of these lines, you can do what's called a reroute. And you can move that reroute around to a different location. And I can also move our nodes around. So I can just left click, highlight all those, and then click and drag and drag those out a little bit. So that between the reroute and the organization, that's gonna help a little bit. And I always make sure that my blueprint logic flows from left to right and then events I create from top to bottom. Now, the last key thing that I want to cover this episode is what's called a function. 
At various points in our game, we already talked about this. We might want to reference whether or not the player is currently walking and switch them to running or vice versa. So what we can do is we could take all of this logic, all this programming that we already did, and we could collapse it into what's called a function. And that then makes it referenceable and reusable in basically any part of our game. And so the way we do that is we can highlight all those nodes, and then we right click anywhere on the highlighted text. And there's an option down here to collapse to a function. And it collapses all of that into a single node and we can move it over. And this is also gonna help tremendously just keeping our blueprints tight and organized. Now, when you create that new function, you'll see that appear over here on the left-hand side. And you can rename your function by right-clicking on it and going to rename. Just one really quick tip here, always keep your functions a single word. So you can capitalize words in it, but don't put any spaces. There've been time and time again where I put a space in a function name and then suddenly the engine just goes eh, and it changes the space and then I'm trying to reference a function in the game and it says no function found, it causes all sorts of headaches. So just keep them one string of text and everything will be just fine. So if you right click rename, we're gonna title this our walk run toggle. And you see that actually update on the graph. And if you double click on that or in our My Blueprint panel over here, that's gonna open up our function as a separate tab. And you see it's got an execution pin on the left-hand side, it connects right up, and there's our reusable function. And I can close right out of that. All right, so the last thing we're gonna to do today is we're gonna organize our build a little bit. I know it's not the most fun, but especially if you ever start working with other people on projects, it's really important to have comments on everything, keep it all organized so that everybody else can reference what you're doing and why. So we're just gonna highlight that, hit C on your keyboard to comment, and I'm just gonna put in a walk, run, toggle on our comment. And I'm also gonna organize our functions and our variables because eventually we are going to have dozens of variables and dozens of functions on this character. I can promise you that. And so as we expand that list more and more, it's going to become increasingly difficult to know what each function's doing, what each variable is referencing. So the way we organize these is if I select the function, I can choose what category it is. So I'm just going to select, I'm going to type in movement there, and then it goes under that movement heading and I can collapse that. And I'm going to do the same thing with each of these variables. And now that I've created a category, I could just select movement, come down to our max run speed, select movement max walk speed, select movement, and I will compile and save. We'll do one last check to make sure everything is working properly with our character. Yep, he's looking good. So that concludes our episode today, but I hope you got a really good preliminary understanding of blueprints. And I'll leave you with a little treat before we truly end the episode. So if you go back into our third person character and you go to our max run speed, I'm going to switch this to something obscene. Like let's say 5,000. Compile, save. Now keep in mind our character by default still has a movement speed of 500, so it's not going to be updated until we hit caps lock, and now we hit caps lock again, and let's just kind of zoom around the level. Yeah, a lot more fun, right? Uh, but he takes a little bit of time to get his momentum up to speed, and you could just pretend it's a nice skating rink and slide across the screen a little bit. So in our next episode, I'm going to show you how to create a new camera component on our third person character so that we can easily toggle back and forth between the first person view and the third person view and also set up a mouse wheel zoom to make it possible for the player to do that too. So I hope to see you then.